Well hello and welcome back to another episode. It's great to see you all. I hope you're doing well. So today we're continuing with our series on writing a ray tracer from scratch in C++ using only the standard libraries and the SDL2 library for display. And in particular in this episode I want to focus on geometric transforms. Now this may not seem like it has an immediate connection to ray tracing and it's certainly something that uh, most, as far as I've seen, tutorials on ray tracing don't really touch upon, but then that's kind of, I think, the reason why most ray tracing tutorials only ever look at spheres and planes, because as shapes go, those are pretty simple to do, and you don't really need to worry about anything like what we're going to talk about today. However, if you want to do ray tracing with more complicated and more interesting shapes like cones and cylinders and things like that, then having this kind of... Uh, technique built into the ray tracing code really makes life much simpler, as we'll come to see in later episodes when we come to look at those kinds of shapes. So today um, what we're going to talk about is geometric transforms and as any of you that have been following the series will know, so far we've only been able to create a unit radius sphere positioned at the origin and the class that we wrote that actually handles the sphere the object sphere class has no provision in it for setting the position or the size of the sphere and this does seem extremely limited and i i dare say some people have have uh, considered that to be a major limitation and have probably wondered what on earth i'm i'm doing why am i wasting my time with this anyone can make you know, put the coordinates for the centre of the sphere into the sphere equation and use that that way. Indeed, that is how I did it in the last version, the first version I made of this series uh, many, many months ago. But the reason I've done it that way is that what we're going to do is actually define all our objects in their own local coordinate space. And that is what we've done. We've defined our sphere in its own coordinate space. So it's always centred at the origin in its own coordinate space. And then what we're going to do is define a geometric transform that defines the mapping between the local coordinate space of an object and the world space in which that object exists. And that mapping then defines the transform that says where that object should go in the scene, in world coordinates, but also it can define things like scaling and rotation and things like that, which is obviously very powerful. And where that becomes extremely powerful is that we can define uneven scalings if we want. So we can distort our sphere, as you can see in the image here. We can distort it so we can stretch it in one axis or two axes, and we can create a variety of different shapes simply by adjusting the scaling factor in our geometric transform. So this is an incredibly powerful Powerful approach. There's quite a lot to go over today, so I've got a feeling this is going to be quite a long episode. Um, we'll see how it goes. There, there is quite a lot of code to write to make this work, and also I want to take the time at the beginning just to go over the theory, um, really, of how geometric transforms work. So we've got a lot to cover, so I'm not going to talk too much anymore now. We're just going to jump into it. Um, it just leaves me to say, as I always do, that if you do like this video, please do remember to hit that like button. It really helps with the YouTube algorithm, so thank you very much. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to my channel so that you don't have to miss any future videos. Thank you very much. Right, without much further ado, I suggest let's jump to it and let's start by looking at the theory of geometric transforms and then we'll move on to looking at how we can implement that in code and then make that part of the ray tracing code that we've been developing so far. Okay, let's go. Okay, so geometric transforms. Well, let's, let's start by considering the most basic transform. So in general, a geometric transform can be defined like this. So we have some vector v hat, which is what we want. This vector here is equal to the product of our transform matrix and our original vector. So this is the original vector here, v, v1, v2, v3, and then we are transforming that to give us v hat which gives v hat 1, v hat 2, and v hat 3. And we have a 3 by 3 matrix here of coefficients that define the geometric transform. I, in previous videos, I've covered about matrix multiplication and matrix vector multiplication and things, so I'm not going to go over that here. I will put links in the description below to the relevant episodes, if you, um, the relevant other videos, if you want to go and have a look at those, uh, feel free to do so. So what we have here, this is a matrix A, which defines the transform that is applied to the vector V to give V hat, okay? The problem, though, is how do we calculate the values of A11 through to A33 that we need in order to achieve the transform that we want? Okay, so let's let's look at the very simplest case. Okay, the simplest case would be, of course, where A is simply an identity matrix, as we see here, 
And of course, this simplifies simply to v1 hat is equal to v1, v2 hat equals v2, and v3 hat is equal to v3, exactly as we would expect. So in that case, our transform matrix A has done nothing. It has left the vector v completely unchanged. Okay, so v hat is exactly the same as v as we would expect. Now, that actually leads us quite neatly on to scaling and how we would define the coefficients of the matrix to implement scaling. So if we change the diagonal values to be something other than 1, we can show that this would represent a scaling. So instead of having just 1, 1, 1 along the diagonal, I've replaced those now with A11, A22, and A33. And we can show, if you work that out, that gives us now V1 hat is equal to A11, V1 v2 hat is equal to a22 v2 and v3 hat is equal to a33 v3 and that is obviously a scaling operation so we're scaling the v1 component of v by a11 and the v2 component of uh, v by a22 and so on in order to give v hat okay so the values a11 a22 and a33 define a scaling in each of the three axes okay so that's pretty straightforward so far all right Scaling is easy, but what about other transforms such as rotation? Well, let's look at rotation in just two dimensions to start with. So a two-dimensional vector can be rotated using what we see here. So we're replacing so two dimensions, so we have just two uh, values for v hat and for v, and we have a two-by-two two matrix for our transform, which contains the coefficients of cos, cos theta, or cosine theta, minus sine theta, sine theta, and cos theta just like so. So that's well known, I'm not going to talk about the derivation of anything like that. So, And that of course equates to v1 hat is equal to v1 cos theta minus v2 sine theta, and v2 hat is equal to v1 sine theta plus v2 cos theta, where theta of course is the angle of rotation. And this will rotate the original vector v hat about the origin to give a new vector v hat, okay? Okay, so, I mean, 2D is easy, we all know about that, right? But what about rotations in three dimensions? Now, in the two-dimensional case, there is only one axis about which we can rotate. So points in 2D space essentially lie on a plane, so it makes sense that the only axis about which we can rotate them is the axis perpendicular to that plane, as shown in the illustration at the bottom here, where the large white arrow represents the normal to the plane, or a vector perpendicular to the plane, and any points lying in that plane, the only angle we can rotate them about is an angle about that vector, as you can see. Okay. But in three dimensions, there are three axes about which we could rotate. We could rotate about the x-axis, about the y-axis, or indeed about the z-axis, as you can see here. So we have three angles that represent our rotation. And just as a quick note, this is only one way of describing uh, rotation in three dimensions. There are a variety of other ways of doing it. I'm only going to focus on this technique, and this is all we're going to use in the code, at least so far. And we're not going to touch on quaternions or anything like that at the moment. I think that's just going to be um, a step too far <laughs> at this stage. So we're just focusing on, on this way of doing it. So we have effectively three angles, theta x, theta y, and theta z, that define our rotation about each of the principal axes. Okay, so we need to compute the rotation about each axis in turn, right? To form each matrix, though, we only need to think about the 2D case that we saw before and the particular axes that we wish to rotate about. So the 2D rotation matrix we saw before was given by this, cos theta minus sine theta sine theta cos theta, okay, as we saw before. And to rotate by the x-axis, considering that first as an example, by theta x, we wish to keep the x-axis constant. If you think about it, we're not changing anything about it, so we're just rotating about the x-axis. So we can deform the transform matrix in three dimensions for the 3x3 three three case, as you see here. Okay? So notice that this is just the 2D rotation matrix superimposed onto the identity matrix, such that the first element, A11, is left unchanged. So here's our first element, it's still 1, we've left that unchanged. And you see the first, the first row and the first column are unchanged, and then we've just put the 2D rotation matrix in here. Okay? That's pretty easy. And it follows that the other two axes are similar. So that then gives us the rotation matrix AX for X, as we just saw, and then AY becomes this one, and AZ becomes this one. Okay, so you see in each case, if AX we're keeping A11 constant, AY we're keeping A22 constant, and AZ we're keeping A33 constant, okay? And you can see that works. It's important to note the order of the signs. They do change a little bit. 
Um, and that is because we're using uh, the right-hand rule to define our rotations. Again, I'm, I'm not going to go into that uh, in any depth uh, for this video right now. Okay. But take it as read, those are our three-dimensional, three-by-three transform matrices to perform rotation about each of the axes x, y, and z, respectively. Okay, so that's not too bad, but what if I wanted to rotate about more than just one axis at a time? Well, luckily we can combine the transform matrices together by simply taking the matrix product. So, our complete rotation in all three axes would be given by A is equal to AZ theta Z times AY theta Y times AX theta X, which of course then looks like this. So we have the transform matrix for Z, the transform matrix for Y, and the transform matrix for X. Now I've covered matrix multiplication in a previous video, um, so I'll put a link to that in the description below. I'm not going to talk about it anymore or in any detail here, so if you're interested in that or you want to know more, then go and check out the other video and uh, you can learn more about that. Okay, okay so what makes this method so incredibly powerful is actually the way that we can combine transforms together into a single transformation matrix. So we can combine scaling with rotation in just the same way that we combined all the rotations together. So here we have our scaling matrix SX, SY, SZ along the diagonal as we saw. And then we have our transform matrix for theta Z, a transform matrix for theta Y and transform matrix for theta X. And we can take the product of all of those to get one single three by three matrix that will then combine the rotation in all three axes with the scaling as well. Now that's incredibly powerful because it makes it very easy then to work with that as just one matrix. So in which case the new vector v hat would simply be given by v hat is equal to a times v where a is the combined transform matrix. And this would rotate v by theta z, then by theta y, then by theta x, and then finally apply the scaling. Note the order in which the transforms are applied, that is quite important. But wait, I hear you say, what about translation? Now, of course, you'd think translation would be the very simplest case of uh, uh, geometric transforms, and indeed, really, you would be right. This is a very good question, actually. Of course, to translate a vector by another vector, we simply add them together, giving so v hat is equal to v plus uh, t, where t is our transform matrix with elements t, x, t, y, t, z, defining uh, the translations we want in the x, y, and z axes, respectively. So that's incredibly simple. If you if you work that out, of course, that gives v1 hat is equal to v1 plus t, x, v2 hat is equal to v2 plus t, y, and v3 hat is equal to v3 plus t, z, exactly what we would expect. Now, that's really easy. But what would happen? How? What if we wanted to be able to combine all of our transforms together into a single matrix, and that's really what we want to do. But how can we include translation? Because there's nothing here that we can do by just taking the matrix product. We don't have a three by three matrix here that defines the translation, we just have another vector. So what can we do? Well, luckily there is a way that we can combine translation with all the other transforms using what are known as homogeneous coordinates. Now I'm not going to talk about those in any detail, we're simply going to use them. There's a lot of extra information about homogeneous coordinates, homogeneous coordinates out there. Um, you can just search for it and, and read about it. They're really used for doing perspective transforms and things like that and have various very powerful properties. But we're only interested really today in one property that they have, which is the way that they allow us to create a transform matrix that defines translation that we can then combine with the transform matrices for scaling and rotation that we've already seen. So let's have a look at how that works. Now to make this work we need actually to add an extra element to our vector v, okay, which then becomes v equals v1, v2, v3 and 1. So whereas before v was um, a 1 by 3, um, a three element vector, a three dimensional vector. What we've done now is change V to be a four dimensional vector simply by putting an extra element in which is equal to one, okay? And we can modify our transform matrices in a similar way to make them four by four, okay? So A113 to A33, that's the original three by three transform matrix that we had. And all we've done is added an extra row and an extra, an extra row, sorry, and an extra column that are in both cases equal to zero, 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 one okay so in effect we've just expanded the identity matrix okay by adding the extra column and the extra row as you can see there right now to 
include a translation, we can modify A as follows. So we'd have A11 through to A33, the original transformation coefficients, and now we can actually put Tx, Ty, and Tz that defines our translation in X, Y, and Z respectively over here in the last column, making sure that we leave this lower diagonal element here equal to 1. And of course, the bottom uh, row, um, the first three elements all equal to 0. Okay, so let's just have a look at actually how that works. Well, if we replace A11 through to A33 with the identity matrix. So we don't want any transformation except for translation. Now let's work this out. We get that V1 hat, okay, is equal to 1 times V1, okay, plus 0 times V2, plus 0 times V3, plus 1 there times Tx, okay, and V2 hat is equal to 0 times V1, okay, plus 1 times v2 plus 0 times v3 plus ty times 1, okay? And the same for v3. So you can see that what essentially that's going to give is that v1 hat is equal to v1 plus tx, v2 hat is equal to v2 plus ty, and v3 hat is equal to v3 plus tz, which is exactly what we saw before for the very basic implementation of a translation, except now that we have our translation defined in a 4x4 four four matrix. So what's really cool about that is we can now combine all of our transforms together if we express them in homogeneous coordinates. So our scaling about x, y, and z becomes this. So we have sx, sy, and sz here defined in the first uh, three by three, and then like so. Our translation becomes, as we've just seen that one, and then our rotations rx, ry, and rz for rotations about the x, y, and z axes respectively become, as you would expect, uh, what you see here. In, in every case, all we've done is put the 3x3 three three transformation matrix that we had before into this part of the 4x4 four four matrix and left the last, the new last column and the new last row as 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, so what's incredibly powerful about that now is that we can combine all of those together into a single transformation matrix, which is going to give us A is equal to T, of x, y, z times s of x, y, z times r, x, r, y, r, z. Okay, or actually I've done that wrong, haven't I? It should be r, z, r, y, r, x, but yeah, you know, for the sake of argument, it's okay. So the point is we can combine all of the transforms together to give a single transform matrix A, okay? And our new vector can simply be found by v hat is equal to A times V, okay? And what's incredibly great about all of this and incredibly powerful about all of this is that we can recover V from V hat. In other words, we can do the in reverse transformation quite simply by multiplying by the inverse of A. So V is simply equal to A to the minus one, that's the inverse of the matrix A, multiplied by V hat. Now, I'm not gonna talk about matrix inverses here, again, that's something I've covered in a previous video, um, so I'll put a link in the description below to that as well, and you can go and have a look at that if you're interested. So, the question is, how does all this apply to ray tracing? So we've seen that we can create a 4x4 matrix um, to represent our transformations, and we can combine the individual individual geometric transforms together to create one single matrix and we can find the compute the inverse of that matrix if we wanted to do the transformation the other way so we can go from one in other words we can go from one coordinate system so we can go from our local coordinate system to our world coordinate system and then we can use the inverse of a to go back from world to local okay that's really important and very powerful and we will see more actually about why that's so important when we come to look at the code later but just first let's just say how does this actually apply to ray tracing. What we actually have is a situation like this. So we have so far defined, uh, our ray, written our ray tracing code to work just for a unit radius sphere centered at the origin, which looks something like this. But, okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Now, what we've said is that we want to define our sphere just about its uh, on its own local coordinate system, which I've labeled here as U, V, and W. That might get a little bit confusing, don't, don't worry about it. Just for the sphere's local coordinate system, just for now, we're defining its three axes as U, V, and W. Now those U, V, and W um, vectors exist within our world coordinate system labeled here as X, Y, and Z, shown with having a considerably larger range. And what happens is, is our geometric transform defines how we can map between the local coordinate system and the world coordinate system. So for example, we can define a translation which would move our uh, sphere 
uh, to somewhere else in the scene. Now notice that the sphere is still defined at the origin of its local UVW coordinate system. And this is why we've written the code the way that we have. Okay, so we don't need to worry about modifying the sphere equation to include the location of the center because all we're going to do is define a geometric transform that translates the local coordinate system to where we want it to be in the world coordinate system. And likewise, we can do the same for scaling. So we can define a scaling like so, in this case an uneven scaling, so I scale just the, along the um, u-axis, uh, in fact actually along the x-axis. So in reality, as far as the uh, the maths is concerned, the sphere hasn't changed. It is still a unit radius sphere centered at the origin of the UVW coordinate system. All we've done is added a scaling to our transform that defines the mapping from the UVW coordinate space to the XYZ or world coordinate space. And of course we can scale it more the other way as well, which would give us uh, something like that. So we can create a variety of different sphere shapes. And that's actually really very powerful, as we will come to see in later episodes when we go on to look at more complicated shapes, being able to define the shape in its own local coordinate system where we can keep everything simple so it's always centered at the origin and it always has dimensions equal to one, really makes things very simple. And then we simply define how we map from that coordinate space into the world coordinate space and that allows us to put the object where we want it and shape it to be exactly what we want. This is a really powerful technique. So. We've covered a lot of theory there. Um, I know maybe that's a bit heavy going. Um, if anything is confusing, hopefully that will become more clear when we come to look at the code. So I suggest we do that now. Let's go and have a look at how we can write code in C++ to implement what we've just been talking about. Now to do this, we're going to use uh, the QB matrix 2 class that I've talked about previously in my series on linear algebra in C++. This is included in the linear algebra library that we are building this project around that I covered how to write that before. Um, I do still think that qualifies as writing a ray tracer from scratch because it is, um, you know, I did develop the code <laughs> to do these things myself, which is available on GitHub along, of course, with the code for this episode and every episode in this ray tracing series. Anyway, let's jump in and let's have a look at how we can write code to implement geometric transforms. Okay, so just having a quick look, I'm here in the terminal, so I am continuing with the code from the previous episode. I've copied that into a new directory called episode 5 code or EP5 code. You don't need to do that. If you've been following along the series, just carry on working in whatever directory you're in. If you haven't been following on and you're just jumping in at this point, um, that's fine. Uh, and I'm assuming then you've pulled the code down from the GitHub repository, you've cloned it or whatever. Um, you will have a set of files that should look like this. Okay, so we have our main directory there with our main um, code. And then in the QB ray trace subdirectory, we then have the other files that we've been defining so far. QB linalg, of course, being the linear algebra library that is described in the other series of videos. And what we're going to do is in this folder, in the QB row trace, we're going to create two new files called gtfm.hpp that I've just started working on and gtfm.cpp are going to be a class that we're going to use to represent the geometric transform. So let's look first at gtfm.hpp. Okay, so we're starting a new file. So as always, we're going to do include guards, uh, gtfmh hash define, gtfmh and hash end if. So include guards, of course, just mean that the uh, compiler knows if it's seen this code before, it doesn't need to compile it multiple times. Uh, we need to include a bunch of stuff. Oops, if I could, oh dear, come on. Okay, hash include, we need to bring in from the linear algebra library, so dot slash qblinalg slash qbvector dot h, as we've been using that so far. And we also need to bring in uh, now qblinalg slash QB matrix dot H. We haven't used that one yet in this series. And we're also going to include ray dot HPP. Okay, and as always, we're going to keep everything in our QBRT namespace. Just helps to keep things tidy. Uh, now, before we define our class, we're going to define actually a couple of constants that are going to be, you'll see what these are used for in a moment. These are going to be called direction flag values. Okay, now this is a way of doing things that I really quite like. It allows us to define, well, let me just write the code and then, then you'll see. So we have const expression, um, bool, 
fwd forward uh, t form for forward transform is defined as being true, and const expr rule bckt form for backwards transform is equal to, oops, if I could spell false. So what we're defining is within our QBRT namespace, we define two constants expressions, which gives us these variables, forward t-form and bckt form. Forward t-form is defined as true, and bckt form is defined as false. So we can use these later on in our functions to, to tell the transform uh, which way we want to go, whether we, when we apply the transform, we can say whether we want to go forwards or backwards by simply passing forward t-form or bck t-form. And that's really nice because it saves us having to remember whether a uh, value of true means forward or backwards. Okay, so just a nice way of working. So let's define our class. We have a class and we're calling our class gt, uh, gt form, like so, which I just think works well. And we're going to define our public things. We of course need the construct or and destructor, okay. So, gt form for our constructor, no input parameters, destructor looks just like so. Now we're going to, we need a constructor as well to construct from a pair of matrices, okay. So, this is going to be gt form, gt form as before, const qb matrix 2. So it's called QB matrix 2 because it's for two dimensional matrices specifically. Okay, um, forward and const QB matrix 2 type double uh, reference BCK. Okay, so we can construct from two matrices that represent the forward and backwards transforms respectively. Right, now we need function to set translation, rotation, and scale components. This can be void, doesn't need to return anything. Void, I'm going to call it set transform. Okay, it's going to be const qb vector double reference translation. So a vector to define our translation. Okay, I always like to tab things out like this, put them across different lines. You don't have to do that, but I just think it looks nice. Um, we have a vector, similar vector for our rotation, and you can probably guess that we're going to have a qb vector type double for our scale. Just like so. Okay. Let's go back to there. And now we have functions to return the uh, transform matrices. Matrices, like so. Okay, so QB matrix 2, type double, uh, get forward. Okay, we'll return the forward transform QB matrix 2, double, get backward to return the reverse transform. Pretty straightforward. Okay. Then we need function to apply the transform. Now we need two different versions of this because I want to be able to apply this not just to uh, vectors but also to members of the ray class. That's why we actually we included ray.hpp up here. So that just makes our life easier if we do that. So we have qbrt colon colon ray. That's our return type of course which belongs to the qbrt namespace. Our function is called apply and it accepts as input const qbrt colon colon ray reference input ray and now all dir flag. Now this is what I was talking about before. So dir flag we can set to either fwd t form or bck t form and it just makes it easy to see whether from the code uh, when anyone's reading the code back later or even when we're writing it it just helps us remember so true will mean the forward transform and back bck t form or false is going to mean the backward transform okay we'll see how that works uh, a little bit later we also then need one to apply to vector so your qb vector um, type double and const uh, qb vector type double reference input vector and bool dir flag. Okay, so we've overloaded the apply function of two different types. So one, if we pass a vector to it as input, it returns a vector as output, and one, if we pass a member of the ray class to it, it returns a member of the ray class as output, which is um, what we want. We also need to overload some operators. In fact, only one really. Um, we need to overload the, no actually two, so we need to overload first of all 
the multiply operator. Now note we have to declare this as friend, so this function operator here start is not actually a member of the class of the of the GT form class, but it's defined as a friend of the class, which means it has access to the class's private members, which is very useful. Okay, that is going to accept as input const qbrt colon colon gt form reference left hand side of LHS and const qbrt colon colon gt form reference right hand side. Okay, so it accepts obviously left hand side, right hand side of two instances of gt form, and we're going to write code that um, uh, makes sure that we can handle multiplications of that easily. We also need to overload the assignment operator, okay, uh, which will return an instance of gt form. This is operator, of course this does not need to be defined as friend, okay, and it accepts as input const uh, gt form reference right hand side, just like that, okay. Because we're already in here, I don't think it's necessary to put qbrt colon colon there, to be honest, but no, never mind. I'm going to define one other function that's very helpful for debug. We're going to uh, function to print transform matrix to uh, std out, which is going to be void print matrix rule bir flag. Okay, so we can print the two matrices. Okay. Then want to, to also define a function to allow printing vectors. I'm probably not going to use these in this video, but these are very handy for debug. So we do static void print vectors declared as static, so it doesn't need to be called from a specific instance of the class. And a const qb vector type double reference vector, just like so. Right, and now we have some private members. We have our private function first void print const qb matrix to double reference matrix. We'll see why we need that later. And then we have just a couple of private members. QB matrix to type double M underscore F W D T F M, which is defined as being four by four, of course. And QB matrix to double M B C K T F M also four by four. Okay, so we're there four by four because we're using the homogeneous coordinates as we've seen before and we need a semicolon there at the end of the class definition and that should be that. So let's save that. Now let's move on to having a look how would we actually implement this in C++ code. So let's have a look. Okay, so I've created a new file that's called gtfm.cpp in the same directory as, directory as before and all we need to do is hash include gtfm.hpp that we've just been working with. We need to define our constructor and destructor Destruct or pair, of course. So qbrt colon colon gt form colon colon gt form. This is the constructor. Now we do actually need to do things, some things here. We are going to set forward and backward transforms to identity matrices. Okay, it's a good idea just in case you know someone tries to do something with it before defining anything. We don't just want to leave them as all zero. So we just need to do m underscore forward dot set to identity. And that is taken care of by the QB matrix two class, which of course I've talked about in the other video. I've mentioned about that before. There is a link in the description below, of course. And we do the same for BCK TFM as well, set to identity, just like that, okay? Now the destructor, we don't really need any code in there, but we have to define it anyway the GT form like so and we don't put anything there right we have our function also to construct from a pair of matrices okay so it's qbrt colon colon gt form colon colon gt form because it's a constructor const qb matrix to double reference forward and const qb matrix to double reference CK4 backwards. Okay. Now we're going to do a little bit of code here just to verify, capital e, verify that the inputs are for R4 by 4. Now I often miss out doing verification code and things in these videos, but it is a good idea um, to do. So anyway, we can do it easily. If forward.get num rows is not equal to 4. Oops, 
Right, does it need an extra bracket there? Okay, like so. Or this is double pipe forward dot get num calls is not equal to four. Okay. Or and again, I'm tabbing things out just to make it nice. BCK dot get num rows. I'm guessing you can see where we're going with this now. Oop. Put that back there and double pipe. And BCK get num calls is not equal to four. Okay. So in that case, we are going to throw a standard exception from the standard library just got invalid argument. We could create our own, but it doesn't seem necessary. And we'll put our error message as cannot construct GT form inputs are not all four by four. Okay, so it's good practice just to define exceptions like that if anything is going to happen. And really it's very simple, assuming we get through that, we simply do M forward TFM equals FWD and M BCK TFM equals uh, BCK semicolon, that's not an L, and that's a B. Right, okay, just like that. Okay, pretty straightforward. There we go. Okay, so now we need a function to set the transfer. Okay, so this is where it starts to get a little bit more interesting. So we have void QBRT colon colon GT form colon colon set transform const qb vector oops const qb vector double reference translation um, just because I like to I'm tabbing those out again you don't have to do that const qb vector double reference uh, rotation and const qb vector double reference scale okay just like that now in our function the first thing we're going to do is define a matrix for each component of the transform okay so we can have qb matrix 2 double translation matrix which is 4 by 4 okay and qb matrix to double rotation matrix matrix x right which is of course four by four and qb matrix to double rotation matrix y four by four qb matrix to double rotation matrix z um, four by four matrix to double scale matrix okay? or 4 by 4 because of course we're using homogeneous coordinates as we've talked about I'm just going to put some blank lines in there so we can try and keep things more in the middle now first thing we need to set these to identity right so easy translation matrix dot set to identity just like so and of course, rotation matrix X set to identity like so, and rotation matrix Y set to identity, and rotation matrix Z set to identity, just like that, and of course, scale matrix got set to identity. Okay? Now, we're going to populate these with the appropriate values. Okay, so first, the translation matrix. Okay, so that's easy. Do translation matrix dot set element uh, zero three translation get element zero. Okay, so we are setting the fourth column. Um, as we saw in the matrix before when we were looking at the transforms. Okay, so that's the first row, fourth column, and then we want translation matrix dot set element. Uh, this is going to be the second row, fourth column. Translation get element one and translation matrix set element two by 
three for the, of course, the um, third row, fourth column, and translation get element two, just like that. Okay, and then very similar for the rotation matrices. Okay, so we have rotation matrix Z set element zero zero cosine and rotation get element two like so rotation matrix Z dot set element. One, I'm taking my time a little bit because I don't want to make a mistake. Is sign rotation get element two rotation matrix Z set element uh, one zero. Yep, it's, uh, minus sign rotation get get element two and rotation matrix Z set element. One cosine of rotation dot get element two. Okay. Now what we're going to do? This code is actually very similar for x, y, and z. So I'm going to do a bit of copying and pasting, and we're going to change it. So this is going to be rotation matrix y. And we are going to set elements, now we have to get these right, 0, 0, 0, 2, and 2, 0, and 2, 2. And the signs of co, cosine, minus sine, sine, cosine, just like that. Okay, and this one is going to be x. And we set elements starting from 1, 1 to... 1, 2, 2, 1, and 2, 2, okay, and we have cosine, sine, minus sine, cosine, those are already right, now we do need to change these as well, so there we're getting from element 2 of rotation, these are going to be element 1, and these will be element 0, okay, there we go, good use of copy and paste there, I think, otherwise it's a lot, and finally we have to also do the Scale matrix. So scale matrix dot set element um, zero zero scale dot get element zero. Okay. Scale matrix dot set element um, one one scale dot get element one and scale matrix dot set element two two scale dot get element two. Just like that. Okay, and then finally, we are going to combine to give the final forward transform matrix. Okay, so we are assuming that when the user calls the uh, set transform uh, function, that they are specifically setting the forward transform matrix. There is no scenario uh, that I'm working to at the moment where they would ever set the reverse matrix but I mean you could do that you could put the uh, relevant uh, flag uh, variable in there and you could detect it and you could change how we do things accordingly but I'm just doing it this way now so we have m fwd tfm for the forward transform is equal to and we have translation matrix multiplied by scale matrix there we go scale matrix multiplied by Rotation matrix X, rotation matrix X multiplied by rotation matrix Y multiplied by rotation matrix Z. Now that is the order that I have tested so far and found to work. I do add the caveat that it's possible I will change that later when we come, because of course for a sphere, um, you can't really tell when you rotate it, nothing, nothing really changes. Okay, so that defines the forward transform. And then we simply have to compute the backwards transform by form by taking the inverse, right? So we do M B C K T F M is equal to M forward T F M, right? Just like that. And M underscore B C K T F M dot 
inverse, and that will compute the inverse of that matrix. Right, that's all pretty straightforward. So, a bit of, lot of typing, but straightforward. Okay, so now we have functions to return the transform matrices. Okay, so QB matrix 2 doubles our return type QBRT colon colon GT form colon colon get forward. Uh, simply going to return MFWDTFM, that's really straightforward. And of course, the same the other way, QB matrix 2 double QBRT colon colon GT form dot a colon colon get backward and return M E C K T F M. Okay, just like that. And oh, black line function to apply the transform. So this is really the important bit. Okay, so we have QBRT colon colon ray. So the first one is going to deal with applying it to members of the ray class. So that's what we return. QBRT colon colon gt form colon colon apply const qbrt colon colon ray reference input ray comma bool dir flag okay first thing we're going to do create an output object right which is qbrt colon colon ray output ray Call it whatever we want, but then, and then now we're going to do if dir flag. So if dir flag is true, we're going to apply the forward transform. Right? And do output ray.m underscore point one is equal to this. Okay, because we're talking about this transform. Apply input ray dot m one. So what we're going to do is actually call the uh, function that applies the transform to a vector. Okay, we'll see that in a moment. So it will apply to there, qbrt colon colon fwdtfm because we want to apply in the forward direction. And we do output ray dot m point two is equal to this dot dot apply input ray dot m point two qbrt colon colon fwdtfm output ray dot m lab we've talked about the ray class before and, and the need to do this so I'm not going to mention it again output ray dot m point two minus output ray dot m point one okay and then if dir flag is false meaning that we want to apply the backward transform then we do very very similar code of course output ray dot m Point one is equal to this apply input ray dot m point one qbrt colon colon bck tfm output ray dot m point two equals this apply input ray m point two qbrt colon colon bck tfm now this could actually have been done much easier. I could just have passed dir flag actually <laughs> to there. When I first typed it, wrote this code, I didn't think of that. But that's a refactoring you could do if you wanted. It might make the code a little bit simpler. But I think it's okay. It definitely works as it is anyway. So we'll stick with that. It's m point two minus output ray dot m point one. Okay, that's all of that. And then of course we need to return output ray, and that's it. Right, so now we need to define the function that applies our transform to a vector, especially as we've actually just used it. We've written code here that we're going to use the one applied to a vector. So QB vector double is our return type. Uh, QBRT colon colon GT form colon colon apply const QB vector double reference input vector dir flag. Okay, so first thing we need to do, convert input vector to a four element vector. So all of our vectors that we're using in the ray tracer so far, they are all three dimensional. So the first thing we have to do is convert them to four dimensional so that we can use homogeneous coordinates to apply the transform. Okay, so we do std colon colon vector type double temp data, so this is using the vector class in the standard library, temp data is equal to input vector get 
element zero, comma. Input vector get element one. Input vector get element two and one point zero. Okay. Right, and now we're going to put that into a QB vector class object. So we do QB vector double temp vector initialize with temp data, just like that. We're going to create a vector for the result. QB vector double result vector. Okay, just like that. And now we're going to do this. So if DIR flag is true, we're going to apply forward transform result vector equals mfwd tfm multiplied by temp vector so that's really straightforward that's all we have to do and else down here we apply the backward transform result vector equals mbck tfm multiplied by temp vector just like that and then finally, we need to reform the output as a three element vector, okay? So we do QB vector double, okay, initialized with STD vector double, uh, result vector dot get element zero, comma, tap things out again, Result vector dot get element one and result vector get element two. And we're simply, of course, going to ignore the last element. So we're just taking the first three elements of the four uh, dimensional vector and we are simply going to return that. And that's how we use modulus coordinates. Return output vector. Okay. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so now we need to talk about overloaded operators. So first of all, we are going to look at the multiply operator. Now this is really interesting. We have to specifically define this as being in the QBRT namespace. Okay, now we don't normally have to do that within the CPP file, but we have to do it here because otherwise the compiler has no way of knowing that we, because we defined it as a friend, um, it doesn't automatically belong to the QBRT namespace, which means if we don't specifically tell the compiler that this is within the QBRT namespace, then it causes all sorts of problems when we try to use it because it doesn't know, you know it doesn't actually have access to the private members in the way it's supposed to do. So we have to specifically do that. And we define cross QBRT colon colon gt form operator multiply const QBRT colon colon gt form reference left hand side and const QBRT colon colon gt form reference right hand side just like that. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is form the product of the two forward transforms. Yeah, it's pretty easy. QB matrix two type double FWD result forward result is equal to LHS dot M underscore M M underscore FWD TFM. So this is why this function is defined as friend. So it means we can access these private uh, members directly, which is very convenient. M underscore forward DF TFM multiplied by RHS dot M forward TFM. So that's simply going to do the multiplication between the left and the right sides. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is, we are going to compute the backward transform as the inverse of the forward transform. Now, we could simply take the product of the two backward transforms that we have. Okay, so the, both the left-hand side and the right-hand side inputs to this function will contain a backwards transform, but we're not going to do that. And the reason is because there would be a risk of compounding errors. Okay, so the the function that does the in, computes the inverse of the matrix is a numerical function, and it's not necessarily 100% right to the very um, far numbers of, of decimal places. And what that means, if we were to simply to take the backward transforms and multiply them together, there's a danger that we'll be compounding errors that have cropped up. So what we're actually going to do is simply take the product of the two forward transforms and then compute the inverse of that. So we define QB matrix uh, 
to a type double, right? A BCK result is equal to forward result to start with, right? And then we're going to do obviously BCK result dot inverse to compute the inverse of that. And now we need to form the final uh, result. From the final result, which is going to be QBRT colon colon GT form. Uh, final result, FWD result, and BCK result. That is really the only time where we're going to need to use this form as a constructor, to be honest, but uh, there we go. And then we simply return that, return final result. Okay, there we go. That's that one. We need to also overload the assignment operator. It's QBRT colon colon GT form is our return type. QBRT colon colon GT form uh, colon colon operator equals uh, const QBRT colon colon GT form reference right hand side is the only input. Okay. And we need to make sure that we're not assigning to ourselves. First of all, okay. So if this is not equal to uh, right hand side, so we're not assigning to ourselves, then we simply do m fwdtfm is equal to right hand side dot m underscore fwdtfm, just like that. And m bck tfm right hand side dot m bck bck tfm, just like that. And then we return this, or the value pointed to by this, in precisely, okay. And very quickly, these are useful for debug. We have just a function to print the transform matrix to std out. Void qbrt colon colon gt form colon colon print matrix, Google dir flag. And in there, we simply have if dir flag. This is obviously the forward transform we call internal print function that we're going to define in a moment, uh, like that. Else, um, print m b c k t f m. I, I've never actually liked doing it that way. You can, <laughs> but I prefer to put the curly braces in. I, I don't know. That, that's just personal style. Right, that's all we need for that function. Bum, 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 bum. And then we have our private one is QBRT void, QBRT colon colon GT form, colon colon print, const QB matrix to double uh, reference matrix, the input matrix. Okay, and we do int n rows is equal to matrix dot get num rows, and int n calls is matrix dot get num calls, like so. And then we simply loop over those four int row equals zero in row less than n rows plus plus row. Pretty basic. And of course we're going to loop col as well for int col equals zero in col less less than n calls plus plus col. Okay. And within there we are going to use stdc out. And then we're using std fixed because we want to define a fixed precision. Okay, it's a really powerful technique that I like that. So we can force it to have three decimal places and matrix dot get element uh, row col obviously, and then put a space between them like so. Okay, that's it. And outside there, we just do std c out std and l which will move us to the next line and that's that function and finally we have our function to print vectors as well okay so void dbrt colon colon gt form colon colon print vector and this is declared static so we can just use it um, qb vector double reference input vector very similar to what we've just done. Int n rows is equal to input vector dot get num dims with the dimensions, and then for int row equals zero row less than n rows semicolon plus plus row, just like that. And std c out std fixed 
std precision three input vector get element row std and l. Okay, and that is everything. <laughs> now that is quite a lot of code that we've typed there. There's a great possibility I've made some mistakes. So what we're going to do now, let's jump to the window, uh, to the terminal, sorry, and let's just check that we can still compile everything. Okay, so at my terminal, if I do ls minus l, we can see we have gtfm.cpp and gtfm.hpp. I'm going to go back to the uh, root folder here, and I'm simply going to use the make file that we've talked about before that should run and do the compiling. I had run make clean before, um, and predictably we have a bunch of errors. Let's just have a look. So that looks a pretty basic one in the constructor gtfm.cpp line 26. Let's have a look at that. <clears throat> so in gtfm.cpp line 26, there we go. Yes, that should be a semicolon. Save, let's try again. Right, uh, the next error Oh, yeah, of course, that should be M underscore. So that is line 88 in gtfm.cpp. So let's have a look at that. Line 88. There it is, of course. That is obviously an M. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let's try again. Yeah, we're getting there. Uh, FWDTFM is not a member. It should be... Yes, yes, of course. At line 111, 112... So I've got that wrong everywhere, 118, 119. Okay, we can look at those. So we defined those uh, in our header file. Forward. They are, of course, forward t-form and bck t-form. So let's just have a look where, where have I used those. Uh, ba -dum, ba -dum. Yeah. Forward t-form. Sorry. <laughs> bck form and bck t form i think that's probably it yeah all right save that let's try again okay getting there output vector was not declared did you mean input vector no i didn't uh line 154 let's look at that 154 return output vector oh right yeah see output vector Okay, and adjust the tabbings like so. So we compute output vector and we return output vector, right? Uh, print, did you mean print? Yes, I did, line 198. And precision is not a member. Okay, all right, let's have a look at that. So let's look at line 198 first. 198, print is of course a capital P. And precision isn't working because Mm. Hang on a moment. <laughs> Obvious one. It is std colon colon uh, set precision, like so. Now, the reason we can do that, we haven't included anything extra to make those work. And the reason we can do that is because that's brought in through the QB matrix 2 um, header file. So, okay, let's save that. And hopefully, now if we go back to our terminal, we should be able to compile without errors. And indeed we can. Now we do get an interesting warning here. So this warning comes up from the QB matrix.h at line 556 that control reaches the end of a non-void function. And this is actually, I discovered a small bug I made in the linear algebra library. Now I don't like having warnings. So let's go and have a look at QB matrix.h from the linear algebra library. Okay, so this is the QB matrix 2 class. So let's just whiz down to that line 556. 556 is here. Okay. And the problem, this is interesting. This is in the overloading of the assignment operator. And what I did, I put return star this inside this block of code. So this is the block that checks whether we're assigning to ourselves. And the problem is that even in the instance that we are assigning to ourselves, we still need to have a return value. But we fix that very simply by moving return star this out of that block and just put it at the end of the function and save that. And now if we compile our main code, yeah, let's just uh, make sure because that's only a header file so it doesn't get picked up. Run make clean, run make, let it run through and compile everything. 
Okay, and everything compiles without errors, and if we run our QB ray code, we get exactly the image that we had before. Of course, because all we've done, we've defined our class for geometric transforms, but we haven't actually used it for anything yet. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to move on to looking at how we can modify our code, firstly to allow us to do multiple objects, and then secondly to actually implement the transform class that we've just been talking about. Okay, so we've had a look at uh, the code that we need to actually implement the geometric transforms and of course we've looked at the theory behind those geometric transforms. So what we need to do next, in order to be able to actually use geometric transforms, we need to modify some of the code that we've written previously um, in the series. And we're going to start by looking at the code for the object base class because that's going to actually take care of our... Um, geometric transform matrix it's going to store the geometric transform object that we're going to use uh, so let's jump in and have a look at that now okay so i'm here in the object base.hpp file um, as you can see there that we've developed previously in this series and you can see at the moment this contains the code uh, really the sort of basic things a test intersection function that we're going to use and also um, a, pr a public uh, data member there to store the base color of our object again something else that we're not actually using specifically at the moment but we will um, as we move on so the first thing that we need to change here is that we need to include uh, new class so we need to hash include uh, gtfm.hpp okay for our geometric transform class that we've just been working on and we then need a function to I'm going to put this in here function to set the transform matrix okay okay so we have our function which we're going to use to set the transform matrix that is just void it doesn't need to be virtual because we're not going to override this um, for any of our objects and we're going to declare virtual void no, void set uh, transform matrix and this is going to accept as input const qbrt colon colon gt form reference transform matrix so it's not actually a transform matrix we're accepting as input a reference to a gt form object okay so let's save that that's everything we need there and then we're also going to need to store the geometric transform applied to the object okay so it's qbrt colon colon gt form m underscore transform matrix so we go along just like that okay so that's all the modifications we need to object base dot hpp so let's move on to object base dot cpp and see what we need to do there OK, so this is object base.cpp, and we don't need to make very many changes here. The only thing that we need to do is actually define our function here, um, void uh, qbrt, qbrt colon colon, object base colon colon set transform matrix, like so, um, const qbrt colon colon gt form reference transform matrix just like so and all this needs to do is m transform matrix equals transform matrix just like that okay so that is everything that we need to change for object base.hpp and object base.cpp so to actually make this work we need to make some changes to uh, our sphere class okay so in object so in object sphere .hpp, uh, there isn't a whole lot of code here. Um, all we need to do here is hash include uh, gtfm.hpp. We'll bring that in there. We're not actually going to use it. And the one thing I have just noticed, this should have the override keyword at the end of the function declaration for test intersection. Now, I don't know why I missed that off. It didn't seem to stop it working, but it should be there. So we'll save that. Okay, now let's move on to object sphere .cpp. Okay, so here I am in object sphere.cpp, and 
this is where we're actually going to do the interesting bits. We're going to actually apply the transform. So at the moment, if you look at how this code works, when we come into test intersection, this is the function that's called when we've, we've cast a ray, which we pass to it the ray that's been cast from the camera. And this will calculate and return the intersection point and the local normal and eventually the local color. And what it does is simply take the ray and then it does the necessary maths on that ray directly. Now what we're going to do, instead of doing that, before we do any of the maths to test for an intersection, we are going to apply the geometric transform to the cast ray. Now, the reason we do that, the cast ray is in the world coordinate system, but we've defined our object, our sphere, in its own local coordinate system where it exists at the origin and it has a radius of one. But we want to be able to put it anywhere we want in the scene and have any radius we like, even um, you know, uneven scaling on the different axes. And the way we do that, as I've said before, is we have to transform between the two coordinate systems. So cast ray exists in the world coordinate system. So the first thing we need to do is transform that into the local coordinate system of the sphere before we do anything. So let's have a look at that. The very first thing that we do up here, we are going to copy the ray and apply the backwards. Now that's really important to the backwards transform. Okay, so we do QBRT colon colon ray, because we're making a new ray, BCK ray, is equal to M underscore transform matrix dot apply, apply, uh, to cast ray, and QBRT colon colon BCKT form to apply it backwards. Now it's really important that we are applying the backwards transform. So when we specify the transform matrix, you know, for example, suppose we want the sphere positioned at um, 111, the vector 111, that's the transform that we send, 111, okay? But when we apply this to the cast ray, we want to do the transform the other way, because we're transforming from world coordinates back to the local coordinates. So 111 in that case, in this example, would dictate the transform from local to world. So to go from world to local is the inverse of that. Okay, so that's why we're using the backwards transform or the BCKT form uh, transform there. All of the maths and everything there stays exactly the same. The only difference is that from now on, we're not working on cast ray, we are now working on BCK ray. Okay, so all of these references to cast ray, we simply change to BCK ray. And here. And here. Okay, so where we need to make a change is all of the basic maths is the same. All we've done is change cast ray to BCK ray. And what we're going to do now is we're going to create a new QB vector object called POI semicolon there's so a for point of intersection and then rather than calculating the intersection point directly as we've done we replace this with POI and this one as well okay so POI for point of intersection and of course we replace cast ray with BCK ray like that okay and save right so what that now gives us, point of intersection tells us the location of the intersection in the local coordinate system. So this is where it gets really interesting because that's in local coordinate system. We need to transform that back now into world coordinates to understand where the point of intersection actually occurred in the scene. Okay, so we do this. We transform the intersection point back into world coordinates. Okay. So we do int point, okay, so we're now calculating intersection point here is m underscore transform matrix dot apply to POI uh, QBRT colon colon FWDT form. So that's really important. So here we're applying the transformation in the other direction. So we here we applied the transform to go from world coordinates to local, and here we're applying it to go from local coordinates to world coordinates, okay? Now we need to do a little bit of other stuff here now to compute the local normal as well, because obviously things have changed and our sphere may not be a sphere anymore. So we have to do a little, a few little things here. We do, keep, first of all, QB vector double object origin. We need to calculate where the origin is. Okay, now in its, actually it's always in the same place, uh, in its local coordinate system. So all we're gonna do is initialize a new QB vector object 
to 0, 0, 0, like that. That is object origin. Okay. And then we can apply the transform to that to give new object origin is equal to m transform matrix apply object origin tbrt colon colon fwdt form for the forward transform okay and then local normal is no is now going to be intersection point minus new object origin okay and then local normal dot normalize exactly as we had before and one additional change i want to add code to return the base color okay so it be simple local color equals m underscore base color just like that and save that okay and that is everything that we need to do in object sphere.cpp okay so the key point here is that we apply the backwards transform first to our cast ray to transform from world coordinates to local coordinates then we do everything in our ray tracing exactly as we did before to be honest and then we transform back we use the forward transform to transform the point of intersection back into the world coordinates so that we know where it actually is okay and that's really it, it it's not as complicated as it may seem so if we compile and run that now we should get exactly the same result that we had before so let's give that a try okay so I'm on my terminal so let's do that and just for the sake of clarity just to do run make clean to make it tidy let's run make and let it compile everything hopefully without errors okay good so far right and now if we run QB ray we get exactly the result we had before now that's good because the transform matrices automatically default to the identity matrix for both the forward and the reverse transform which is what we want so we are getting exactly the same result now to look at something a little bit more interesting we're going to make some changes to the scene class and what we're also going to do is introduce multiple objects we have written the code to support that but at the moment we haven't bothered because we've only been able to have one object at the origin so let's look at how we can modify the scene class to put in multiple spheres in different locations and apply some different scalings to them okay so let's have a look at that now let's close that and let's jump to scene.hpp in scene.cpp sorry in the first instance okay so i'm here in the scene.cpp file and we're going to make some changes here to where we get we're configuring everything and we're going to leave the camera everything there exactly as it is and down here we have construct a test sphere we create just one right what we're actually going to do is create two more so we're going to do m underscore object list dot pushback std colon make shared pbrt colon colon object sphere just like that and we are going to make another qbrt object sphere okay and m object list dot pushback std colon make shared qbrt colon colon object sphere qbrt colon colon object uh, object sphere like so okay so we've now created three spheres in our scene right now what we're going to do before we do the lights we're going to put in a new block here we're actually going to uh, modify spheres so what we're going to do is first of all create uh, the necessary uh, GT form objects, the QBRT colon 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 GT form. We're going to call test, create test matrix one, test matrix two, and test matrix three, just like that. And now we're going to set them. Okay, so test matrix one dot set transform QB vector double. So remember, we set the translation first d vector double and we're going to set this to x minus 1.5 y 0 z 0 okay and now we're going to do uh, oops no close and close and comma okay and then we have to set uh, the rotation to be vector double std vector double and the rotation we're going to do 0 0 0 there's not really any point rotating a sphere right and qb vector double std vector double okay and this is the scaling so we're going to scale by a half in the x-axis a half in the y-axis and 0 
in the z-axis. So we have uneven scaling. Okay, and close that. Okay. Now we're going to do the same thing. Test matrix two. Dot set transform qd vector double std vector double, and we're going to set the translation. This is at zero zero zero, so that will be in the center, comma, and we need to set the rotation. This will just be zero zero zero, of course. on a 0 0.75 in the x-axis and 0 0.5 in the y and z axes respectively. Okay, that's that one. And test matrix 3, set transform, qb vector double, std vector double. Okay, and put this on to 1.5, 0 0.0, 0 0.0, 0 .0 so shifted the other direction in the x-axis. And QB vector double STD vector double rotation zero of course like so and QB vector double STD vector double and we are going to scale this by 0 0.75, 0 0.75, and 0 0.75, so an even scaling. Okay. And now we need to actually apply those transform matrices to the objects. So we're going to do m underscore object list dot at zero. It's the first one. And set transform matrix and test matrix one. And m object list dot at one. Set transform matrix test matrix two. And m to set transform matrix test matrix 3. Okay, and I'm going to modify the colors as well because we've made it a bit more interesting. Why not make the objects in different colors? So we also have m object list dot at zero uh, dot uh, m base color. We just set it specifically as equal to qb vector double std vector and we're going to pass 64.0, 128.0, and 200.0. Okay, and then object list dot at one, m base color, qb vector double, std vector double, and this one will be 255.0, 128.0, and 0.0. .0. Now it's worth interesting, worth pointing out actually at the moment the RGB values we are specifying between 0 and 255, which kind of makes it pointless using floating point, um, especially double precision as we are doing it. But when we come to look probably in the next video, when we're going to look at planes and shadows, we're going to look at actually how we modify the image class that we're using to handle the image data to scale things properly automatically. And once we do that, then we will specify these as being values between zero and one. But for now, just for the sake of simplicity, we're sticking to uh, this format. Um, so object list at two, m base color equals qb vector double std vector double. And this one is going to be 255.0, 200.0, and 0, 0.0 okay so those are blue orange and yellow okay and then construct a test light let's just save that construct a test light we leave that alone and down in render let's have a look what have we got bum, 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 bum. that's we don't make any changes to any of that we generate our ray as normal and then we have this will automatically loop through calls calls the test intersection method for every object for each ray and we get back the intensity color valid illum sets are false we loop through all our lights but we only have one at the moment and then we calculate the maximum distance now we do need to make some changes here okay 
So let's have a look. At the moment, we shaded our sphere just to be red and scaled by the intensity, which is this code here. So what we're going to do, we want to change that. For now, let's just comment that out. Yeah. Comment that out like so. And we're going to do instead output image dot come up dot set pixel x comma y. And we want local color. We're getting local color back. It comes back from here, okay, when we call test intersection. So we're using local color dot get get element zero multiplied by intensity. Okay. I think you can see how that's working, and I'm doing my tabbing thing that I like to do. We get element one multiplied by intensity and local color dot get element two multiplied intensity just like that okay and now the other thing that we want to do is in these cases we don't want to set them to black we actually just want to leave unchanged so let's just put a comment in else we leave this pixel unchanged and also the same here leave this pixel unchanged okay just like that right that is everything that we need to change in the scene class okay so if we save that now, now one thing that I just want to do that I just think is a bit better, I want to come up here and I did put the light at, yes, let's put the light at minus five. I just, just for the sake of it, I think it just looks a bit better. Okay, so let's save that. Now let's go to our terminal, compile and run. Okay, so let's put, just run make. Okay, and QB ray. Yes, and there we go. So now we get three spheres, not just one, and notice how we've applied uneven scaling to them. So we can use the geometric transform method, not just to move a sphere to be somewhere else in the scene, although clearly we can do that, but we can also now modify its shape. So we can scale them and we can apply uneven scaling. So all of these objects, as we have just seen, they are only spheres. There's nothing else going on. They are just spheres. And we can set their color. And well, as you can see, we're now starting to get towards something that's really powerful. And I hope you can see now how it's worth taking the time that we've been taking to develop this code because it's going to give us a really powerful platform, you know, on which we can go on to expand and to do all sorts of much more complicated things. I often think there's a reason that, you know, many ray tracing tutorials really only talk about spheres and planes, and that's because they're the simplest cases, to be honest. Um, and uh, to do anything else, you really need to start introducing things like the geometric transform class that we've looked at today and all that sort of thing. So as we move forward, we're going to now look at more complicated things. In the next video, we're going to look at planes and shadows, notably, and we're going to make changes to the image class and things to make all that work properly. And then moving on from there, we'll start looking at more interesting things, reflections and so on, and also different shapes. So it should really start to get a lot more interesting. Anyway, that's really everything I wanted to talk about today. It's been really quite a long video. Um, if you've made it this far through the video, thank you very much for hanging in there, and I really hope you've enjoyed it and found it useful. We've taken a good look at the theory behind uh, geometric transforms, and we've looked at the C++ code that we need to actually to write to actually implement that theory. And then we've looked at how we can incorporate that into the ray tracing code that we've already written. And it really starts to show how this is building up to be what I, I think will be really quite a powerful ray tracing platform with a great deal of flexibility. Anyway, like I said, I think I've rambled on for long enough today. And uh, so I think we're gonna leave it there. The next video, as I say, we're gonna look at planes and shadows. And then from there, we're gonna move on to look at other shapes and also things like reflections and stuff like that. So really starting to get a lot more interesting. And we're gonna start creating some images that really look a lot more like the classic images that you see produced by ray tracing software. So anyway, just leaves me to say, as I always do, thank you very much for watching. I really hope you've enjoyed the video. It's been a great deal of pleasure making it, so I really hope it's useful to you in some way. And, um, yeah, I really look forward to seeing you in the next one. If you haven't subscribed, please do consider doing so, because then you won't have to miss the next video, okay? And if you have liked this video, please do remember to hit the like button, because it really does help with the YouTube alg algorithm, so, the YouTube algorithm, so, um, Thank you very much. <laughs> anyway, listen, it's been a pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed it, and thank you very much for watching. Bye.